Good Good morning. Let me start us off with a word of prayer. Our God, thank you for today. Thank you for uh, your community of uh, saints. Uh, Lord, we, we pray for your blessing on our time this morning. Uh, we pray that you will use your word to speak to your people, uh, and that through this you will draw us closer to yourself, that you will uh, shape us more into the image of your Son. Uh, we pray that you will uh, convict us where we need uh, convicting, and that you will give us direction where we need that too. Uh, we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So today is the last normal message in this uh, series on blessing that we've been doing the last four weeks. We've talked about what it means to bless, what the, what the Bible means by the word bless. We've talked about how that theme develops over uh, the scriptures. We've talked about uh, the word of faith movement and, and what that has to say about blessing and how it sort of focuses a lot of its energy and attention on that. Uh, but we have one more thing to cover. But before we do that, uh, we we'll just want to remind us that next week we're going to have this sort of uh, appendix to the series where we're, it's going to be a question and response. And uh, so far I've gotten a few questions, but I don't have your question yet. And I, I need your question. I need it because I've got to do something this week. Uh, no, no, I... Uh, I want to be able to answer uh, or at least respond to whatever questions this series has raised for you. Just try to get that to me in writing so I can start working on that this week. I want to bring us here at the end of the series. I, I want to start us off by going back to where we started, and that's 1 Peter 3, verse 9. Peter says, Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. Bless. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. Peter tells us that when we are wronged, when we uh, are insulted, taken advantage of, and so on, the proper response is not to wrong back and insult back and, and revile back. The proper response as Christians is to bless. Not because we're weak, not because we are doormats, but because that's why we became followers of Christ in the first place, is so that we would be a people who bless. The church is designed to be a people who bless. Why did God ever dream up such a thing as the church in the first place? Why does He call you or me or the person next to you or anyone to follow Jesus? It's so that we can be a people who bless. Now, what does it mean to bless? Let us remember. Uh, let me refresh our memories. I, we didn't talk about this last week, but here's the working definition of blessing that we've been using all through the series, and that is a blessing is an act that expresses the goodwill of the blesser toward the blessee. It's an act that expresses goodwill. And if the church is designed to be a people who bless then we might say it like this, that the church is designed to be a people who express their goodwill. And so the questions that I want to let guide our thoughts this morning come right out of that. If the church is designed to be a people who express their goodwill, then to whom are we to express that goodwill? Who are we to bless? And how are we supposed to bless? What form is that supposed to take? And those questions take us beyond the scope of what Peter is talking about in this chapter, and it begs the larger question of the nature of the church. Well, we've talked about how the Bible uses the word, we've talked about the theme of it in Scripture, we've talked about what Jesus says, and now we talk about the church. What is the, the role of the church in this whole topic of blessing? And here's my thesis for the morning, that we are to bless God we're to bless one another, and we're to bless the world. That the church exists to bless God, one another, and the world. So first of all, the church is designed to bless God, to demonstrate our goodwill toward God. Now, how do we do that, practically speaking? Listen to what uh, the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 15. 
He says, may the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in, in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Romans is all about how different kinds of people, Jew and Gentile, are included together in the family of God. And here at the end, as he's starting to kind of tie the ribbon on the end of the letter, he says, may the God grant you to live in harmony so that you can do this. Glorify God. We express our goodwill toward God when we glorify him. Now, glorify is a good churchy word, if I ever heard one. So what does that mean? Glorify means that you speak and live, but usually that you speak in a way that increases the honor and the importance and the reputation of God. So we bless God when we acknowledge his power, when we acknowledge his ultimacy and his supremacy, and when we confess our need for his mercy, when we thank him for his grace, when, uh, when we attribute good things to him like truth and beauty and integrity and faithfulness, that's glorifying him. We speak in a way that increases his honor and his reputation. I mean, that's worship. When the church gathers together and speaks and reads and, uh, and sings and preaches and so on, whether that's gathering in, in a small group or gathering on a, a Sunday morning or in any other gathering, we come to bless God, to speak in ways that enhance His reputation. Praising Him and glorifying Him is the primary way and maybe the only real way that we have of blessing Him. And you can't glorify Him and be honest if you don't have goodwill toward Him. But when you do have goodwill toward Him, a posture of thankfulness and trust, the primary way that gets expressed is through worship. We bless God because of who he is and what he's done. Now, there are two parts to that. We bless, we bless God, uh, we honor him, we praise him, we glorify him because of his character, who he is, and because of his behavior, what he has done. So listen to Psalm 107, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord. Why? Because he is Good. It's not because of something in particular that he's done. It's because of who he is. It's his character. This is a line that gets repeated multiple times in the book of Psalms. Why do they want us to praise God? It's because of his faithful love, because of his character. Praise sometimes centers around God's character, like we have on the wall in the lobby, that he is merciful and gracious and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Listen to Ephesians chapter 1. This is what Paul says. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in, the, in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. So why does Paul praise God? He actually uses the word bless. Why does he do that? Because God has done something. He has stored up for us blessings in the unseen world, the heavenly places, because he chose us. And the letter goes on for the next several verses, itemizing the things that God has done. He's uh, lavished his grace on us. He's shared his spirit with us. And so what has he done for you? And that can be big picture, cosmic, uh, salvation level stuff, or that can be something that is really particular and daily that God has done this in my life. But now listen to this. We only bless God if we bless one another and we bless the world around us. You can say the right things all day long, But if you don't have genuine goodwill toward God, then it falls on deaf ears. 
It's not really a blessing. It's not an expression of goodwill. It's a fake. It's a fraud. But if you do have goodwill toward God, it will lead not only to praise, but to a lifestyle that matches. I mean, listen to what the prophet Isaiah says in the opening chapter of his book. He says, this is God speaking, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, plead the widow's cause. If you don't love people and treat people the way that God loves them, it doesn't matter how neat your doctrine is. It doesn't matter if your mind affirms all the right things and if your mouth says all the right things, if in the end your life is not being transformed to be a blessing to one another and to the world. Or as James puts it, faith without works is dead. Worship is both the beginning place for the church. It is what fills us with the the power and the energy to go and to be his people in the world. But it is also the end point for the church. The reason that we bless others is that they might join us in blessing God in our worship of him. So the church is designed, first of all, to bless God. Second, the church is designed to bless one another, to demonstrate our goodwill toward each other within the family of faith. Now, how do we do that, practically speaking? Romans 12 Verse 13, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Or in 1 Peter 4, verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Do you hear a theme already? We express goodwill toward one another when we extend hospitality to each other. Now, hospitality is not just letting someone sleep on your couch. It's not just sharing food with someone, although it often takes that form. Hospitality is making room for another person, whether that's physically, giving them a, a chair at the table or a, a bed, or, um, or I, I imagine you walk into someone's house and the house is all cluttered and the couch is all covered with stuff and they, oh, I'm so glad that you came and they take some of the stuff on the couch and they just move it over so there's a seat for you. It's hospitality is they're making room for you. It could be physically, it could be emotionally, it could be spiritually, creating a space for someone else to come in. It's welcoming another person Hospitality is a fundamental expression of goodwill because it's a tangible way of saying, I have goodwill toward you. It's wanting to see the other person's needs being met. The, the reason why we, the first thing we think of when we hear the word hospitality is a food or a, a bed is that it is this expression of, of goodwill and welcome. And in the most tangible sense. Listen to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Or in Hebrews chapter uh, 10. Let us consider how to stir one another uh, to, to, want, to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. We express goodwill toward one another when we encourage one another. And encouragement is not as narrow as, uh, as like writing a, an encouraging note to someone. Although I'm glad I, we have a, a ministry of ladies that are doing that. That's, that's a great way of doing it. Uh, but encouragement is... Uh, it includes that, but it also includes more than that. It's spurring one another on to do what is right. It is emboldening one another. It's encouraging one another to not give up 
on the faith in their struggle. It's cheerleading, it's accountability, and it's reminding one another of the gospel. It's saying to another person, hey, remember Jesus, remember the hope that you have in him, remember the power that you have in him, remember his example, remember his grace, remember his resurrection, remember his promise, remember that he is Lord over the situation that you're going through. Encouragement expresses goodwill because we demonstrate that we want to see the other person be faithful. We want to help them to grow and to help mature them into a full disciple of Jesus. Now, why do we do that? Well, we bless one another because we believe that Christ is present in the other person. We welcome one another in hospitality because in doing so, we are welcoming Christ himself. We encourage one another because in doing so, we're helping to form Christ in them. We express our goodwill toward fellow followers of Jesus because in doing so, we're expressing our goodwill toward him and toward our God. Think about what Jesus says in Matthew 25. He says, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And those of you who know the text know it'll go on. When did we see you hungry or thirsty? Oh, well, you were doing it for someone else. And when you did it for someone else, you were actually doing it to me. You just didn't realize it. Or uh, Galatians chapter 4, Paul is writing to uh, this church and he calls them my little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. Why does Paul continue to minister to this church? It's toward the end that they would look like Jesus, that Jesus would be formed in them. So why do we show hospitality toward another? Why do we encourage one another? It's because in the other person, we find the presence of Jesus himself. There's a song in our hymnal that some of you know that the the final verse says, Have you ever stood in the family with the Lord there in your midst, seen the face of Christ in your brother? Well, then I'd say you've seen Jesus, my Lord. The church is sometimes called the body of Christ. And when we bless one another, I'm not just blessing the person in front of me, but I'm responding to the presence of Christ there in the space between us. But here's the catch. We can only bless one another if we have goodwill toward one another. All of the encouragement and all of the hospitality and what other, whatever other forms we might have added to that, those two things are not meant to be comprehensive. But whatever way we might bless another, they're not actually a blessing if they don't come from a place of goodwill. That's what a blessing is. It's an expression of goodwill. And that means that you cannot bless someone you have a grudge against. You cannot bless someone that you look down on. You cannot bless someone that you hope to see fail. You cannot march along and do what you think is your Christian duty. Or you can do that, but it's not a blessing. And you are not engaging in the mission of the church until you engage in reconciliation. To be able to bless, you have to clear the air. You have to respect the other. You have to genuinely desire the flourishing and the faithfulness of the other because anything else is not a blessing. So we are designed to bless God when we glorify Him. We are designed to bless one another through hospitality, encouragement, and surely other things that we simply don't have time to talk about or we would be here until a long time. Third, the church is designed to bless the world around us, to demonstrate our goodwill toward the people in our community, the people that we have connections with, uh, the people that we have relationships with, even if they don't live physically close to us, and even people that we will never know but people that don't follow Jesus. So how do we do that? Let me give two suggestions for how the church is to bless people who do not love and follow Jesus. And again, this is not meant to be comprehensive, but I think that it's a good start. 
First of all, look at what Jesus says in Matthew 5. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Or in Romans 10, this is what Paul says, speaking about the Jews. He says, brother, uh, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they uh, may be saved. Most of the scriptures that talk about Christians praying, talk about Christians praying for one another, for the boldness of the other, for the faith of the other. And I think we absolutely should do that. Maybe that could have been number three in ways that we encourage and and show hospitality and we pray for each other. Uh, But there are a few times when the New Testament talks about Christians praying for the unbeliever. I know the small group that I'm a part of has made it a point to pray for our community. Whenever we get together, we always spend a few minutes in prayer and, uh, and we'll identify businesses that we pray for or industries that we pray for. Oh, the people are going to be coming in to, to ski and the, the hotels are going to be flooded. Let's pray for the hotels that they will do well. Let's pray for the economy of our community. Let's pray for the, the police or the fire or the schools or, uh, or, or the government or, uh, or some industry. And I think that that's a good practice. That's a practice that's rooted in Jeremiah 29. But in both of the verses that we just read, the prayer for the community is not just uh, that they would do well, but it's specifically that they would be saved. It's that they would turn from their sin and their pride and their ignorance and that they would acknowledge Jesus as Lord. We pray for our community that they will come to know Jesus. We pray for our customers and our vendors that they will come to know Jesus. We pray for our politicians and our, our, uh, our government officials that they will come to know Jesus. And I, I don't say that tongue in cheek, but I, I say that because our highest desire for anyone is that they would know the love and the grace of my Lord. Prayer expresses our goodwill toward our community because we're asking for the greatest possible thing that we can think of for them. That they would know the hope and the power of Jesus. But the thing about prayer is, it's not something that really communicates blessing because it's not something that is seen. Unless someone wanders in off the street, maybe they catch us in the act of prayer. But this is something that's happening often behind closed doors. This is something that's happening uh, in groups of the church, but it's not something that's uh, visible that the church says, wow, I'm really glad, or that the community would say, wow, I'm really glad that you did that. And so the the church does want to bless in a way that uh, we want to pray, but we also want to bless in a way that the community that speaks their language. Listen to 1 John chapter 3. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Or going back to Matthew 25, we've already looked at this chapter, but Jesus says, then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. The church expresses our goodwill toward the world when we serve their needs. How much does the Bible have to say about caring for the poor, the widow, the orphan, and the foreigner? The answer is like a lot. Like it says a lot about it. In fact, Jesus talks about arming, uh, uh, about uh, caring for the hungry and the sick and the imprisoned in their physical needs as a fundamental function of the church. I don't know uh, if you, well, I, most of you I know if you have children, but I can't just speak broadly for everybody. But if you have children, does your child like to be disciplined? especially when they were younger. No child likes to be disciplined. It's been my experience. But discipline, it it comes from a place of goodwill. I want to see you disabused of this bad habit. 
I want to see you shaped into the kind of person that's going to to be well-adjusted to society. It comes from a place of goodwill, but does the child interpret it as a place of coming from a place of goodwill? Shake your head like this. No, not hardly ever. But are there ways that we can express our goodwill toward our children in ways that do speak their language? Yes, I have ice cream in my freezer at home that communicates the goodwill that I have toward my children, and it speaks their language. Yeah? And that's what we're talking about here, blessing the community in a way that they understand. That means assessing what the needs of the people are around you and ministering to them in a way that they get. Now, why would we want to do this? We bless the world because we believe that Christ is present in the stranger. We serve the poor and we serve the city because we believe that Christ is found in the most unexpected places. Listen again to what he says one more time in Matthew 25. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? Or when did we see you a stranger and welcome you naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. This is critical. We have to get this. That the fundamental reason that the church tries to bless its community is not so that we can convert and grow our numbers and make a bigger name for ourselves. The fundamental reason that the church blesses its community is because in doing so, it is ministering to Christ himself. And if that leads to conversion, that's fantastic. But that's not the primary drive. The primary drive is we serve because in doing so, we're serving Jesus. But again, here's the catch. We only bless the world if we have goodwill toward them. All of the prayer and all of the ministry and whatever things we might add to that list are not actually a blessing if they don't come from a place of goodwill. You cannot bless the community if you uh, pray and serve because it's going to benefit you. Because it's going to make the church look good. Or because uh, you don't like the other person and boy, you'd sure like to see them change. Does the church minister for our own benefit or do we desire the flourishing and the faithfulness of our community? The Apostle Paul tells us that our attitude and our disposition is to resemble that of Jesus who gave up everything, particularly honor and status, and he emptied himself and became a servant for our benefit, not for his. We bless others because in doing so, we are imitating Jesus. We bless God because of what he has done for us in Jesus. And so everything that the church does begins with Jesus, who he is, and what he has accomplished in his death and in his resurrection. And so as we bring this all to a close, I want to invite you to meet again with the resurrected Christ. What do you need to find in him? Do you need to find forgiveness, encouragement, maybe hope? power, boldness, virtue. He invites you to come and to find those things when you meet with him in prayer and when you meet with him in baptism, if you have not uh, given your allegiance to him in baptism. Let me close this with a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you Uh, for this whole uh, study of blessing. Uh, We remember that uh, that every good thing comes from you. Uh, uh, And we, we pray that you will empower us to be a people who bless those around us, that you will show us where we can be hospitable and where we can extend uh, a word of encouragement, 
where we can uh, look out for uh, the, the well-being and the faith of our brothers and sisters. We pray that you'll fill us with boldness in, in uh, reaching uh, out to our community. Father, we pray that, uh, that our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers and our associates would come to know you. We pray for our city, especially as it seems to be growing so quickly right now. We, we ask uh, that, uh, that it will flourish, and in its flourishing, that it will find you and turn that back to you. Father, we ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I love you guys.